I would uh, say that all my research interests are uh, uh, connected uh, with the concept of ecolinguistics. Uh, so I'm interested in factors uh, that change the languages uh, and make it possible for some languages to flourish and other uh, uh, whereas uh, they, they, they make other languages to disappear or vain. So um, I, I think that the uh, social forces uh, that uh, <coughs> have an effect on language use uh, are also reflected in the other historical processes uh, which we can follow uh, in the materials of archaeology, genetics, uh, etc. But I also believe uh, that in the past research of our field, uh, the Uralic studies, uh, these uh, disciplines have uh, far too often been used uh, in a childish or a banal way so that people have just merely been looking for uh, correspondences, uh, like straightforward correspondences of different disciplines. Uh, and uh, and I, I, I always speak uh, in favor of a more context-specific approach. Uh, so here I now look at some contexts uh, where we can uh, be sure that um, the Uralic languages have uh, replaced other languages uh, in the northern Eurasia. Uh, it's, uh, uh, so, uh, it's a general approach uh, and uh, many details are indeed fuzzy uh, and, and, and some of the facts that I mentioned may well be uh, proven to be otherwise, uh, but I still believe uh, that the fact uh, uh, that the linguistic past of the northern Eurasia uh, has been a more uh, <clears throat> uh, more uh, uh, rich in languages and language families than presently, I still think that this fact uh, is a relevant one, uh, and, and I, I, I'm, I'm sure it can be proven on the basis of the uh, linguistic materials that we have uh, at our hands. So uh, I will not uh, um, uh, speak in detail this uh, map of Uralic languages, since I'm sure that most of those present have seen it many times. Uh, but I uh, only uh, say that uh, the area where the Uralic languages are spoken is a fairly uniform one. You only have a few areas which have recently been racified, such as the uh, at the Vina Basin uh, and large parts of Volga Basin, the region we are in now. But we can be pretty sure that uh, if we go back 1000 years, uh, we had Uralic speakers all around in northern and central Russia, including this place uh, right over here, which is now uh, a capital of uh, a Slavic speaking, or mostly Slavic speaking, multinational state. Uh, so, uh, <clears throat> Uh, this uh, Uralic language family, as we all know, consists of different groups. Uh, it's Samic, Finnic, Modwinic, Mari, Permic, uh, and Samoyedic. The groups that can be uh, reconstructed uh, a well-behaving proto-language uh, with uh, sound laws uh, and fully-fledged uh, inflectional morphology. And then we have a group of Ugric languages, this is Hungarian, Mansi and Hanti, that have uh, something to do with each other, so they are languages that belong to the uh, same group, uh, quite clearly, uh, but are different of the other groups in that uh, it's quite hard to reconstruct, reconstruct a well-behaving uh, a proto ugric proto-language that would uh, have sound laws, uh, a real inflectional morphological system that would stand apart from Proto-Uralic. Uh, but still it would be silly to say that the Uralic languages do not belong together in a way or another. I would say that these three groups, Hungarian, Mansi and Hanti, form a kind of Sprachbund that has, uh, uh, it ha that has uh, gone through a long period of internal contacts. So they have borrowed about uh, lexicon as well as morphosyntactic features from each other. 
the numbers that you have uh, here in this uh, scheme or Stammbaum, if you want to call it so, I would call it Stammbusch, so it's a family bush, not a family tree, because I don't really believe in uh, binary branching family tree for Uralic languages. I think that Uralic languages are more a bush like uh, formation. Uh, consisting of these uh, intermediate proto-languages. And the numbers that we have here is the number of reconstructable lexical items for each branch. So we have a reconstruction from the proto sami vocabulary. Uh, this, is, uh, uh, this is provided by Juhani Lehtinanta in 1989. It consists of approximately 1,700. Uh, common word stems for Sami languages. We have a reconstruction from both Proto-Finnic, provided by Petri Kallio lately, consisting of 2,200 lexical items. We have a, uh, a, a reconstruction of proto samoyedic made by Juha Jansson, who also sits here uh, already back in 1977, uh, consisting of uh, approximately 800 words, but since then new uh, vocabulary sources have appeared, and would such a reconstruction be done today, I think that the number of, of proto samoyed words would be slightly bigger. We also have proto permic reconstruction uh, by Shandor Church, consisting of approximately 1,600 words. We don't have yet proto modvinic or proto maric reconstruction, uh, but we can uh, um, uh, we can believe that proto modvinic and proto maric are slightly newer uh, proto languages than the proto perlic proto finnic and proto sami. Uh, these numbers give you an approximate idea of the age of the proto-language. So we have had kind of, kind of proto-languages like proto samoyedic uh, which is likely a, a late Bronze Age proto-language without a, 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 a rich layer of vocabulary related to metallurgy, for instance, and without, uh, without <laughs> concepts related to, uh, to uh, iron items or things like that. And then we have uh, these uh, Iron Age proto languages, Samic, Finnic, uh, Permic, uh, and then we have these still new uh, pro proto languages such as Morbinic and, and Mari that probably uh, uh, dispersed sometimes uh, in the Middle Ages. And then we have this Ugric group, which is a newer, uh, an older one clearly, uh, but uh, quite likely it, it, uh, uh, it's a group of contacting languages that have dispersed from each other. Uh, in a fairly early period. And then obviously on the basis of these uh, intermediate proto-languages, we, we can then reconstruct proto-Uralic. There have been different uh, accounts as to how many word stems or, uh, or reconstructable elements we have in proto-Uralic. Uh, at its minimum, the number given was only 150, but we, this was based on a, a strict binary uh, binary uh, uh, principle so that every word uh, that uh, was reconstructed back in proto uralic should also have a counterpart in Samoyedic uh, because it was believed that a Samoyedic uh, branched from other Uralic languages earlier than the uh, other Uralic languages mm -hmm. branched from each, each other. But if we take a more modest principle uh, and consider proto uralic all those word stems that occur in two or three uh, branches which are not adjacent, I think we can reconstruct several hundreds of proto uralic word stems. On the idea of who is the best specialist uh, in proto uralic reconstruction at, uh, at the time, is, is currently working on a new project of a uralic etymological dictionary, and he said that his dictionary will consist of approximately 900 uh, word uh, entries. So this does not say that uh, Proto-Uralic has 900 words, but at, uh, we have approximately 900 words with more or less uh, wide distribution uh, in the Uralic languages. Uh, the earlier uh, Uralic proto uh, Uralic etymological dictionary that we have Uralisch uh, etymologische Wörterbuch from the year 1986 has 750 uh, uh, words, but uh, many of those are probably not correct. It's quite 
uh, problematic book uh, in many ways, but still gives an approximate idea on the amount of vocabulary that is reconstructable back in Proto-Iraq. So we can look a bit of the Proto-Uralic groups, the core area, the current spread areas, largest spread areas, and, and core areas. By core area, I understand the area that can be considered uh, the earliest area where these proto-languages emerge. This can be reconstructed, obviously, on the basis of uh, paleolinguistic evidence, that is the, the uh, uh, vocabulary reconstructable back to the uh, the proto-language, uh, language contacts, so this is the layers of Morovins from neighboring languages, aerial linguistic variation, so it's a kind of variation that can be uh, considered old from the point of view of uh, comparative methodology, uh, and then also substrates, which I consider the most vital uh, part of this argumentation, and by substrate I understand the elements that uh, derived from the earlier languages spoken in these areas. So whenever we have, for instance, notable toponymic substrate, substrate, this means a notable layer of toponymy from extinct sources in some area, we can uh, make the conclusion uh, that the language only recently spread to that area, uh, and, and this layer of toponyms uh, in the, this, this particular area uh, was preserved uh, through a language shift of an earlier population. In many cases we can identify such substrates. For instance, in the case of Finnish, my mother tongue, uh, we know that um, uh, in almost every area of present-day Finland we have a notable Sami substrate in toponym. Uh, and uh, this is the main argument that we can say that the Sami languages were spoken in the past in the region where Finnish is spoken now. So it was replaced by Finnish and Karelian, and this process of replacement of Sami by Finnish and Karelian uh, took place probably in the uh, late Iron Age, beginning from approximately uh, year, year 1 AD and then continuing up to the Middle Ages, and, and still in the Middle Ages, we have an information of Sami people all around the center of uh, southern Finland and things like that. So, this is the reason why I consider it likely that the Sami languages actually emerged somewhere from here. Uh, whereas the Finnic languages that are now spoken here seem to have had a notable eastern branch uh, that has been uh, ratified since. This is the area I worked with uh, when I uh, uh, wrote, wrote my dissertation about substrates in, in the Divina Basin. So it's this area around the city of Arhangelsk. Uh, and, um, and we know that uh, the, the Finnish and Karelian language areas count as spread zones. They have notable substrates from Sami. Whereas Estonia does not represent substrates from Sami uh, or any other language that we can uh, recognize. So we can be pretty sure that uh, Estonia has been Finnic much longer than Finland. Uh, we can, uh, from, the, from the point of view of aerial linguistic variation, uh, we can conclude that the uh, oldest split between uh, uh, Finnic languages probably took place somewhere here uh, in the Ingria because it's an area that uh, represents many different types of Finnic languages, a small area. Uh, it represents southern Finnic languages such as Estonian, uh, uh, north, uh, eastern Finnic languages such as Kijorian, uh, and, and, and also intermediate languages uh, representing an independent line of development such as body. So we can uh, conclude that this area has a, a long, uh, deep inner language history. Now there is also a theory uh, supported by Estonian archaeologist Walter Lang, who is fairly well informed in uh, linguistics, because uh, his wife is a linguist, uh, that uh, the Finnic languages actually originate uh, from uh, the uh, upriver uh, Daugava, the, the southern part of the present-day Finnic area. And we do know that, for instance, most of uh, what is now Latvia used to be Finnic-speaking still in the Middle Ages. 
So in any case, we know that Finnish, uh, Finnish originates uh, south of the Finnish Gulf and outside present-day Finland. Uh, the close, closest uh, language, uh, closest to Finnic and uh, Sami uh, <clears throat> of all the Uralic branches is Mordvinic. Uh, I would say that Mordvinic, Sami and, uh, 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 and Finnic uh, make up uh, uh, a western group of Uralic. They have many common features. Uh, and, uh, but but the um, deep history of Mordvinic uh, is fairly fuzzy. Mordvinic does not have uh, uh, layers of inner borrowings from other Uralic branches, so we, uh, Finnish has a lot. Finnish has borrowings from Sami, and we know that Finnish had, uh, Finnish had contacts with Burmic languages, for instance, but Mordvinic does not show uh, any uh, contacts with other Uralic branches. Uh, in view of substrate toponymy, uh, and, and also the relative closeness of Mordvinic to Finnic and Sami, uh, we can be uh, still pretty sure that uh, the present-day Mordvinic area probably represents the kind of southern edge or spread zone of Mordvinic that spread from the north. Uh, but for the time being, we are not aware of notable toponymic substrates in the area of Mordvinia, uh, Mordovia proper. So we know about few Turkic substrates in the eastern part of the area, but really uh, uh, all too little. Uh, the history of my languages is a bit uh, um, uh, more understandable. Uh, in the history of Mari languages, we see that the language area has moved over the Volga River. We can be sure that the uh, language originates uh, in the area of present-day Hill Mari language and south of it in the northern Chuvashia and probably also Norge. We know that when the Russians founded the city of Nizhny Novgorod, uh, in 2025, uh, uh, no, 1225, uh, so uh, 1225, uh, at that time this uh, city uh, uh, functioned as an outpost uh, for, uh, for battles uh, between the Russians and the Chinese people. So Chinese, of course, it's a concept that's not only the Mari people that it referred to in later times, but uh, it consists of all kinds of hostile tribes, Turkic and Finno-Ugrans alike. But, uh, <clears throat> but um, so we know that uh, the, the Maris fled both the uh, Turkic and uh, Russian uh, uh, waves of migrations uh, and, and, uh, and went to the east and north and the language area changed. Uh, as for the Burmic languages, we have a very similar situation to uh, Finnic and Sami. We have uh, a northwards spread uh, and, 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 uh, and uh, an Iron Age southern origin. This Iron Age southern origin can be fairly well put in place on the basis of uh, uh, paleolinguistic evidence uh, that has a lot of names for southern trees uh, and, and also some southern animals that are not present uh, in the Komi language area up north. Uh, also, we have some historical evidence that in the area of present-day Tatarstan, which is here, uh, there used to be some type of Burmic population. For instance, there is an oral tradition that the Udmurt people had their own char, Tsar who was residing in the city of Arsk. This is 65 kilometers north uh, from the present-day city of Kazan. Uh, so um, so uh, we can be quite sure that also Burmic originates here uh, in the south from a relatively small area. Samoyedic is very different. Uh, Samoyedic is, uh, as already said, it's deeper than the other uh, languages, so it's, it's a more the time depth uh, and uh, more variation. Uh, and uh, I think that the uh, most, the, the main weight of the variation uh, is uh, within the southern Samoyed that consists of three Selgup languages uh, and then uh, the extinct uh, Siam Samoyed that also uh, represented very different types of languages. So there were Kamas uh, that uh, 
the, uh, the, the last speaker of, uh, of Hamas died in 1989, uh, and then there was Mator, which was taken uh, still in the beginning of the 19th century, uh, and, and, and which is more or less uh, uh, documented in historical sources, and these sources have been investigated by Yevgeny Helinski. Mm -hmm. Uh, and we do know that this Kamas and Mator have been quite different in many respects, representing different types of bran uh, branches of Samoyed languages. So uh, we can be fairly sure that also the Proto-Samoyedic is a southern and eastern phenomenon, uh, originating in the area where we have this uh, majority of variation. Uh, but uh, it probably spread to Nord uh, relatively early, since there is this uh, lateral language of Ghanasan representing many notable archaic features in the Tiber Peninsula. And then we have this Ugric languages. Uh, I already recalled that uh, I believe that the Ugric languages don't go back to a proto Ugric uh, proto language. There, there are, although there are compute, computing views on that matter, especially the Hungarian, Hungarian researchers tend to believe that of Ugric was a sort of well-behaving proto-language, but I still believe that the characteristics of this proto-language, whether it existed or not, were very different of the kind of proto-languages that the proto sami uh, pro uh, proto finnic etc. are. These languages have a fully-fledged case system, for instance, they have a fully-fledged system of verbal inflection, they have a thousand or so uh, new word stems coming from different sources that can be identified in case of Finnic, this is Germanic and Baltic, uh, in case of Sami likewise, uh, etc. Whereas Ubrick have, have none, of, none of that. I will show some examples uh, later on uh, and argue that some of these are actually sub local substrates. But what is interesting here is that we have this area where we have three proto languages spoken in uh, uh, relatively close to each other. Uh, and, and, and then there is, of course, this notable uh, factor of uh, replacement of Hungarian language from, uh, from Western Siberia or Southern, southern Urals region to present-day Hungary. Uh, it's an uh, entirely different story as to how it took place, but we have good reasons to believe that this actually happened. Uh, and it's, of course, related to the uh, mobility of the uh, steppe people, uh, especially the uh, Bulgar dominated um, migration waves uh, in the uh, 7th, 8th, and 9th century. Uh, then, uh, I believe that uh, the uh, probable, uh, or if we look at this area now, we see that uh, in the Iron Age, so the, 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 the proto languages I refer to are mostly Iron Age phenomena. Uh, probably only the proto samoyedic sorry, pro probably only the proto samoyedic can be a bit older. Uh, <clears throat> all the other languages are Iron Age phenomena, uh, and we see that they originate in fairly small areas. And, uh, and uh, it, it would seem to be the case that by the time of these proto languages, most of what is now northern uh, Russia, uh, the Arctic, uh, still spoke some other languages. I would also argue that the fact that we have this Hungarian Munsi and Hunti representing long-lasting old contacts uh, makes uh, the Ugric area a perfect candidate of uh, the Proto-Uralic area. So wherever we put the Ugric uh, Proto-languages, this would also uh, then be the area from where the Proto-Uralic originates, because I think that the Ugric languages really represent the kind of languages that have uh, dispersed from each other or split from each other and then continued to be in contact with each other for a long time uh, and, and this resulted in the emergence of the, uh, of the shared features between these languages including both morphology, morphosyntactic elements as well as uh, vocabulary. Uh, but, uh, uh, what is important is to understand that these uh, shared features do not really uh, make up uh, a well-behaving proto-language pointing to uh, regular sound changes or regular shared innovations. So it's more sp uh, spread innovations uh, pointing to a long-lasting uh, conduct in the same area. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, 
how can we uh, investigate uh, the languages that were uh, in the Arctic before the Uralic? Uh, I think uh, the uh, relevant thing here is the substrate, that's the elements of past languages that are discernible uh, in the toponymy and uh, vocabulary. Uh, in most cases, of course, we lack the kind of toponymic data that we would like to have. Uh, but uh, vocabulary data we have uh, in every case. So there are fairly good uh, lexical sources on all Eurasian uh, languages. And um, we can see that uh, all these 69 groups have a small proto-language area. Uh, and the present speaking areas represent a kind of secondary development that, uh, that uh, took place in the historical era. So this is a kind of a uh, schematic, uh, ecological or ecolinguistic uh, picture uh, of the uh, Uralic languages. We have uh, one language group that uh, has been uh, has uh, left Taiga for step. This is Hungarian, uh, and while adapting to the step environment, uh, the overall cultural characteristics of Hungarian group have turned uh, very different, uh, and and the group has turned mobile, and it has replaced itself from Urals to the uh, Carpathian days. Uh, then we have a, a few groups that have uh, gone over to the Arctic lifestyle. Uh, this is mostly Samic and Samoyedic, so these, these are the, the, the true Arctic groups, but of course also of Ugric in part, although of Ugric areas are sort of uh, intermediate, some parts of Ugric languages are spoken in the Taiga, whereas others are spoken in uh, Dundra. And of course, uh, in all these three cases, we know that the languages originate in uh, Taiga. So in, in the case of Samic, we know that uh, they originate somewhere that is now southern Finland and Karelia. In the case of Samoyedic, we, we, we can make the guess that they originate somewhere where southern Samoyedic was spoken or in between the southern and northern branches. And in the case of Old Kubrick, we also know that there has been this southern contact zone. There are also fairly many uh, southern features uh, that are still uh, present in the Old Kubrick mythology. For instance, these people have a rich uh, horse mythology, uh, although horse is a fairly useless thing uh, uh, in the northern tundra. But these people still have this uh, remembrance of the time that they live somewhere by this step. Uh, <clears throat> there are a few, uh, very few sources on languages that were spoken in the Arctic before Uralic languages that can be probably interpreted uh, uh, as pointing to some substrate groups. Uh, for instance, there is this population called Petchora in some early Russian chronicles of the 12th and 13th century. Uh, it is said in these uh, Russian chronicles that these Petchora people are living uh, in what is now the Congo Republic, and we know uh, that, uh, that in that time it was not, not Kobe speaking. Uh, it's referred to as people who worship stones and, 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 and live in caves and things like that. So it's a very different kind of cultural uh, picture as the Kobe people or the Nenets. Uh, also, these Nenets people have this uh, oral tradition, considering uh, a kind of uh, goblins or people who were there before them, the Sihirkia people. It's like uh, it's a, a mythological tradition, of course, a folklore tradition, but it has this uh, idea that these are the people who were here before us uh, and that we replaced them, and they uh, are somehow still uh, present as, as ghosts or something like that. Uh, so, uh, <clears throat> this of course uh, is very shallow information, and the main information that we have about these um, extinct languages, the linguistic substrate. Uh, the uh, main ways to identify the linguistic substrates uh, are uh, semantic and phonotactic uh, analysis. Uh, so, um, 
as for the uh, semantics, it's often uh, the question about locally confined concepts related to flora and fauna and uh, geographical features uh, that represent a kind of uh, vertical linguistic heritage uh, in uh, contrast to kind of vertical, uh, kind of horizontal linguistic heritage, which is the cultural vector or the cultural borrowings related to things such as religion, metallurgy, artifacts, technologies, etc. Uh, then uh, we have to take, have an eye on for the tactics and, and uh, look if the words that uh, cannot be uh, identified as Uralic or borrowings from some Indo-European sources, if they can uh, be reconstructed back to Proto-Uralic or proto sign or proto sanier or if they represent some kind of phonematic features that uh, that uh, seem to be uh, innovations. Uh, and also, if possible, we should also look for toponymic substrates uh, in the same area where we have these, uh, these uh, uh, substrate uh, layers of vocabulary. Uh, so, for, uh, to begin with, we have uh, the Sami languages, uh, and it's a well-known fact uh, already for more than 100 years that Sami languages lack some of general concepts, uh, of very uh, widespread concepts that are present everywhere in Uralic. Uh, for instance, there is this word uh, for stone, the Finnish kivi, uh, that is present in all the uh, Uralic languages. Uh, but uh, Sami have another word, so all the other languages uh, have, have, have words like kivi, kev, Kev, ki, ker, something like that. The Sami have a kat ki, so it's a very different structure, uh, and the word is uh, completely obsolete, so it does not have any Indo European source, uh, nor has, is any, uh, nor can it be considered a derivation or a compound or uh, onomatopoeic word or anything like that. Uh, a similar case is the word for tree, tree. so the Uralic languages have an old word for tree. Uh, 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 the Finnish U, Hungarian Fa, etc. But in Sami we have another word, Northern Sami Muara, uh, which is uh, in structure it could be uh, Uralic in principle, but it has no parallels of any kind anywhere in Uralic. Uh, a similar case is the word for wind. Uh, the Uralic has a very widespread word for wind, the Finnish Tuli, uh, and uh, the, the uh, uh, Sami languages lack that word, they have another word. Uh, the same goes for the word for snow, although there is some rudiments of the old word for snow in, in southern Sami, but still most of the Sami languages have replaced this word with a new concept, and they have even replaced the word uh, for water. There's also uh, a theory that the Sami word for water actually represents the, uh, the old word for water in the Uralic languages. Uh, uh, and this, this can of course be discussed, but uh, I think for the time being it's important to understand that many, uh, many um, central geographical concepts have been uh, replaced uh, in Sami with words of uh, unidentified uh, origins. If we then go uh, further to individual Sami languages that have emerged after the dispersal of Proto-Sami, uh, we can see that they also represent uh, a large layer of vocabulary uh, that, that's of local character. And these are the words that don't go back even to proto -Sami. They have All of them have very strange phonematic features. Uh, they point to uh, animals and, and flora of Arctic uh, areas uh, such as uh, uh, grassy terrain, uh, capercaillis, long bumping, these are birds. Uh, also marine animals such as shark, walrus, uh, for instance this Russian word for walrus, morsh, uh, which has spread to almost all languages uh, of the world, uh, is uh, Sami borrowing from the Kola Peninsula uh, region, uh, but in, in, in the Sami languages the word is obsolete, so the word does not have any etymology, and it also has a very strange phonematic feature, namely it represents the uh, phoneme esh that, uh, 
vasculate go back to protosomy that, that only emerges uh, after the dispersal of protosomy. So we can conclude that in Russian this is a Sami borrowing, but in Russian, uh, in, in Sami itself it has to be borrowing too. But it has to be borrowed from something that was spoken in, in the Scandinavian, uh, uh, Scandinavian um, uh, uh, icy shore prior to Sami languages. There are similar words uh, with consonant clusters in the beginning of the word, such as the word for dwarf birch, an arctic plant, uh, words for flat stone, uh, frost mound, uh, and things like that. So uh, a large amount of vocabulary uh, pointing to northern concepts uh, that is impossible to reconstruct to the proto-Sami, not to speak about uh, proto uran now, if we look at the, the yes, this is, uh, I just uh, uh, showed this map, which is uh, drawn by Ante Aikio, uh, who has been investigating this Sami substrate. Uh, uh, he uh, is of the opinion that a Sami languages represent two kinds of a substrate that he uh, labels as a Paleo-Lakelandic substrate. This is characteristic for Proto-Sami and derives from the region where the proto sami was spoken, so it is probably southern Finland and Karelia. And then we have this paleo laplandic substrate that is from the actual spread area, that is from the area where Sami languages are spoken now. Uh, and I sympathize with this uh, hypothesis. Now, if we go to uh, the Samoyed languages, uh, I think the situation is actually quite similar. The Samoyed languages have a lot of uh, 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 words that can be considered uh, fairly strange from the point of view of Uralic uh, etymology. Uh, even some uh, central words that are spread everywhere have been replaced by some obsolete concepts. For instance, some, some uh, countables, such as the word for tree. So we have very widespread word for tree. Finnish polome, uh, Sami polma, Morbidian polvo, etc. This is uh, present in every language, but in Samoyedic we then have a completely different word uh, for the concept tree. Uh, and the same goes for the concept four, which was also dis already discussed earlier on this day. Uh, and even such, uh, uh, such uh, very widespread things as the uh, body parts, like the word for hand uh, or the word for foot, uh, are uh, of obsolete origin. Uh, and, uh, for instance, the word for night has also disappeared, and then there is another word for night, uh, and this is a kind of uh, a word that uh, has a very peculiar phonotactic structure. It's, it's one syllable word uh, with a uh, short vowel. It does not look Uralic at all. Usually the Uralic words are, are, are all two syllabic words, but in the proto samoyedic we suddenly have a big group of one syllable content words, meaning such things as. Uh, the night, uh, or reindeer, or something in the middle, or something like that. So they are not, uh, from a phonographic perspective, these are not Uralic words, uh, and for the time being there is no other explanation for them either. So they are not borrowings from those sources which would be available. There are, for instance, evidence for some uh, contacts with the Proto-Turkic in Samoyedic, so the Samoyeds have a word for horse, which is an early German borrowing and is very important, but these words are not like that. These words are something <coughs> completely different. And uh, as was already uh, said uh, by um, Takavi Salminen or uh, the earlier this day, we have a similar uh, uh, phenomenon also in uh, present day Sami, uh, present day Samoyedic languages, uh, all kinds of uh, Northern concepts, in similar manner to Sami languages, uh, are obsolete from the point of view of uh, etymology and often also represent some strange uh, phonotactic features. So, for instance, uh, usually in Samoyedic we have uh, a uh, sound shift uh, that, um, uh, uh, that eliminates most of the L phonemes. L phonemes are only preserved in front of uh, one uh, vowel quality, and other L phonemes uh, 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 change the Y. But then in the proto, in, in, in nenets, we have a lot of words beginning with L, pointing to all kinds of local concepts, such as beaver or grass tassock uh, or something like that. 
there is this yes yeah, so, sorry there is this word for walrus but this is this was already this is uh, what was already discussed that this word for walrus is actually uh, a derivation from the word for teeth uh, but there is another word for uh, for seal which is more likely to be some kind of substrate word and i think also the words for moose eagle uh, lichen, uh, probably word for mountain. These are these don't look like Finno-Ugrian words. So they have either three syllable structures, either one syllable structure, no etymology, uh, and some of them uh, also have uh, other new phonematic features. Uh, as for the uh, of Ugrian languages, I think the situation is a bit different. All well, Ukrainian languages also have a lot of vocabulary that is not present in uh, other Uralic languages and that's not present in Hungarian neither. There is a uh, word list compiled by Maria Shikos on uh, the, uh, the shared vocabulary of Hanti and Mansi languages. Uh, it consists of some 400 words and these are words, most of the times these are words that uh, don't look too regular. I would say that uh, it's quite clear that the words, the words that he, uh, she uh, compares with each other belong together in the sense that they uh, uh, denote the same concept. Uh, but uh, it is not possible to establish any uh, regular uh, way they correspond to each other uh, in, in historical phonematics. Uh, but um, from another point of view, there are no such clear um, phonotactic criteria that would make, uh, that would put these words apart of the Ural Uralic vocabulary in a similar manner to uh, Sami and Samoyedic, where these substrate words really seem to belong to phonotactic uh, odd gro groups. These words are often quite uh, Uralic and they look quite old, but they don't have any uh, cognate words outside of Ugric. And I think that this uh, question really needs uh, further uh, study. So uh, we have something like this. This is a very schematic uh, map of the Uralic groups and their contacts. This should be, of course, uh, uh, take uh, with with uh, some humor. But uh, we have this uh, Iranian and Turkic influences that uh, come from the south, from the, uh, from the steppe, uh, and are present almost everywhere from Mordvinic to uh, of Ugrin languages. Then we have Germanic and Baltic influences that put the Western Uralic apart from the rest, so the Spinnic and uh, Sandic and Finnic mainly, that have a lot of Germanic vocabulary, uh, but also Baltic uh, that's present in uh, Mordvinic. Uh, but then here in the north, we have a large group of uh, languages that have quite clearly left traces uh, in the Uralic <coughs> languages, uh, but it seems to be the case that these languages are now extinct beyond report, uh, if not taking into account the kinds of substrate elements uh, I referred to. Uh, we can still go uh, further and propose that in addition to the Arctic groups, uh, even some taiga groups of Uralic probably uh, went through a process of borrowing from substrate sources. Uh, for instance, uh, in Finnic, many geographical features have obsolete names, uh, words such as Sari, island, or Nieni, peninsula, promontory, or even uh, Oya, which is brook or water source. Uh, then we have uh, kinds of uh, shared words that uh, occur uh, in Germanic and, and Finnic. Uh, usually these are uh, considered as Germanic borrowings in Finnic, but from an Indo-European perspective they are obsolete words. Uh, one word is the word Hülje, for instance. This is the uh, Germanic seal, uh, reconstructing back to Proto-Germanic as Seilquas, uh, and uh, its Finnic counterpart reconstructed as Schulkes. Uh, so this, the one can be borrowed from the other, but neither of them has no etymology outside this region. We also have uh, things like the word for whitefish, uh, the Finnish seek, a Russian seek, uh, 
uh, uh, Swedish C. If you look for the, uh, if you look in the Swedish etymological dictionary, it will tell you that this is a Finnic borrowing. If you look a Finnish etymological dictionary, it will tell you that this is a Swedish borrowing. If you look the Russian etymological dictionary, it will tell you that this is either Finnish or, or Germanic borrowing. But none of them. Uh, says that it's our word and it's also quite clear that uh, that it, it cannot go I mean it cannot go back to uh, early proto finnic for instance it has a very peculiar phonolactic structure with a long vowel uh, before a uh, a uh, an open vowel uh, in the second syllable so it's a new phonolactic type and quite clearly it's some kind of a local Baltic sea substrate uh, a similar word is also the word nerpa, uh, the ring of seal, the Finnish norpa, uh, that's also present in Sami, probably Sami, Noarvi, uh, etc. And then we also have some important names for domestic animals uh, shared by a Finnic and Monwinic that don't seem to have any Indo-European background. So usually, of course, the names for domestic animals such as horses and and, and swines and cows or uh, whatever. These are in the European borrowings in Europe. This is no news for you. Uh, but uh, it's quite interesting that we have uh, words such as the, the Finnish lehmä, cow, that has a regular counterpart in Modwinik, uh, meaning a horse. So this is some kind of a denomination of a big animal. It only occurs in these two branches of Uralic, and this does not have any any background whatsoever outside these two branches. A similar case is the word for swine, the Finnish sika, modwinik duva, etc. Uh, and I also, also think that the horse vocabulary of Ugric languages is a similar case. So the Hanti, Mansi, and Hungarian all share uh, not only the horse mythology I referred to earlier, but also horse vocabulary uh, consisting of uh, words related to horse and riding. riding but these uh, three or four words seem to be of unknown origin. So very uh, important cultural innovations, uh, but they are not of Iranian or Turkic origin. That would be the natural source. So it's something, some completely obsolete words uh, from some kind of an extinct step language. So, uh, <clears throat> as a conclusion, I... Uh, would like to say uh, that I think that in, in the etymology we should uh, make a division between two kinds of borrowings. So this is the horizontal process of borrowing and a vertical process of borrowing. And the horizontal process of borrowing is the kind of borrowing most often discussed about. And this is the kind of uh, borrowing that spreads technologies, artifacts, raw material, religion, things like that, and constitutes cultural areas. Uh, in the case of horizontal borrowing, we usually have the same concepts spread in a large area uh, in many languages sharing some same type of culture. Uh, for instance, the names of related to Christian uh, Christianity in European languages or names related to metals in European languages are all of the same origin, although, of course, uh, they're spread after the dispersal of the European languages in different branches. Uh, often this kind of horizontal borrowing constitutes a cultural area that can be, uh, that can be uh, investigated from the point of view of archaeology. So if you have, for instance, a particular metal, a particular artifact type or a particular religion spreading uh, together with uh, a layer of vocabulary, these, all these things have archaeological counterparts. Whereas uh, the languages often do not have archaeological counterparts because the languages often spread over ecological zones, uh, when, uh, over ecological barriers when uh, different types of, uh, of innovations take place in these languages. Uh, but when language areas spread, uh, usually a process of vertical borrowings takes place, and uh, we have local words that uh, are transmitted from language to another, even in the case of a local language shift. So, for instance, we have now this, uh, this word for uh, walrus, uh, morsh, the Russian morsh, which uh, is probably some kind of Sami substrate in Kola 
uh, Peninsula Russian, but in the Sami language itself, it's also a subscript from some earlier language. And this also makes sense because the war Russies don't occur in the places where the Slavic languages or the Sami languages originate. So if you come to this area where the war Russies are actual uh, or vital, then you have to take this word from somewhere. Uh, yes. Uh, so, uh, um, I think that for both Sami and Samoyedic, we can uh, propose uh, the uh, existence of two layers of substrate, the proto-language level substrate uh, and the individual language level substrate. Uh, other one presenting a tiger zone substrate uh, and another one presenting an arctic substrate. As for the Ubrick languages, I also believe that uh, there is some substrate elements in them, but they are very different. They don't have uh, phonotactic characteristics uh, or, or peculiar phonotactic characteristics that we can find in both Sami and Samoyedic, such as uh, the, uh, like in the in Sami case, we have words that have no vowel harmony, that have second syllable labial vowels, the power innovations we have words with consonant clusters in the word beginning, words with letters or, or phonemes that only emerge after the dispersal of proto-sami. In the nets, we likewise we have words with uh, L in the front of the back vowel. We have one-syllable words. Uh, we have words with some uh, other elements like diphthongs and things like that. In Ogurian, uh, we have uh, also a big amount of words, but not this kind of peculiar phonotactics. So uh, this is probably some other type of uh, substrate, probably uh, uh, a sign of earlier spread. So this would suggest that the proto uh, this uh, uh, process of substrate borrowing was earlier than uh, in the case of Sami and, um, and uh, Sami, but I, we don't know the details. So this is uh, all. Thank you.
or Helinski thought that they are original monosyllables, but this is a regular proto-Uralic type in Samoyed, so it's not uh, in the base of this, this type. Uh, isn't, it, isn't it more with those, uh, those types of words that have this uh, vowel plus a reduced vowel that represents the, this kind of kind of, kind of words? If yeah, you have yeah. a content word with yeah, just yeah. one uh, short, uh, short vowel, no, you consider it also the examples of this consonant and vowel. This is the regular type. The, the vowel sequences, as we now think, they have another origin. And sometimes you think so it's mainly an L, which is represented like the Kuala. So in that type of words, we have a vowel sequence. I think he's right about this. But uh, to the best of my knowledge, in one of the projects uh, you, part, you were participating in or uh, that you were leading uh, was dedicated to, <coughs> uh, to studying uh, language contact within the Uralic family. Yes? <coughs> and the, <coughs> the idea was, as far as I understand, that if we take into account some internal interaction within the family or uh, if we try to reinterpret some inherited words as loan words, uh, we probably will be able to explain some uh, cases, some cognate sets uh, that are irregular from the viewpoint of historical phonology or uh, from the viewpoint of a current version of historical phonology of Uralic. Uh, could you briefly tell uh, what results it really gave? Yeah, uh, I, well, this process, the project is still ongoing, or it's now coming to the end. Uh, we have this one, uh, one uh, book published on this matter, and a new book will come out probably next year, and then two of uh, PhD, uh, PhDs will, will also come out from that project. But um, I think the main uh, thing is that uh, a lot of the vocabulary that you find in the uh, earlier etymological sources, most notably the Uralisches Etymological Logisches Wörterbuch, is uh, actually a words that do not represent regular uh, sound correspondences, but uh, that represent a kind of uh, mixtures of uh, inherited and borrowed words. For instance, a large amount of um, words considered uh, as cognates between Finnic and Permian are probably uh, more likely uh, words that spread uh, from the west to the east uh, through uh, extinct Finnic dialects and are now present in Permian, and they have different types of, uh, of uh, phonological correspondences uh, in Finnic as the real uh, inherited vocabulary. Uh, and, and, and this is also the case, I would say, uh, in between uh, Ugric branches and Fermic in part, because Ubrich and Fermic seem to also, also seem to have a lot of this inner borrowing. But it's not uh, probably straightforward related to this substrate thing, because uh, in any case, these languages that spread to the Arctic represent these substrates, and of course, uh, while spreading to the Arctic, they also became uh, each other's neighbors, and, and, and then this process of mutual borrowing took place. Mm -hmm. uh, did, did you actually manage to solve uh, uh, any traditional problems of uh, historical phonology of uh, uh, this way? Well, uh, <clears throat> not, not all the problems, of course, but I think that at least we can uh, clean up the etymological dictionaries uh, from all types of uh, so-called irregular cognate words. I mean, uh, it's, 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 it's a peculiar fact in the comparative Uralic studies that you have both regular and irregular cognate words. I don't believe that, for instance, in the European etymological dictionaries have uh, regular and irregular cognates. So it's, it's, it's taken for granted. Only those words that follow a regular sound pattern can be considered as regular, uh, can, can be considered as cognate words. But uh, if we have shared words that are not cognates, then we have to explain them somehow. I think uh, in this particular case, I think this uh, Ob-Ugren shared lexicon is the case in point, because in, in Ob-Ugren you have a lot of words that 
the uh, are present in both Hanti and Mansi. And then, if you try to look at the vowels, for instance, or if, the, if you have tried to look at the uh, uh, consonant clusters that they represent, it's very hard to come up with some uh, systematic uh, correspondence between these words. Well, probably Mikhail Shulov has another opinion on that because I know that he works on the open reconstruction, and this would be uh, warmly welcome. But uh, at least it's one of the hardest issues, I think, in this Uralic uh, comparative uh, studies. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned at some point that uh, the place we are now at is uh, also a Uralic area at a certain point. But <clears throat> I don't think it occurred later in your maps of maximum spread. So uh, none of them. So what? branch of your other project. Is it more convenient or what? No, no, the problem with this region, of course, is that we don't know too much about the languages that were spoken here because they are uh, extinct already by the time of the historical sources, uh, but it's usually uh, considered likely that the uh, Uralic groups that resided in this area were the Merian and Muroman. Uh, and uh, this probably Moscow was somewhere uh, in the border zone between Merian and Murovan and Baltic groups because there was also this Baltic groups residing in the central Russia like Gagayali or Gohindi and, and I think that this has been the kind of border region between these groups. Uh, there is now uh, a uh, monograph uh, on uh, what he, what, uh, on the so-called Merian toponymic layer by Alexander Konstantinovich Matveev, who was the best uh, investigator of the substrate uh, toponym in Russia. Uh, this book is freely available in the internet. Of course, the uh, material is quite fuzzy and quite shallow, but I think it's a, a good book in that he has really tried to collect all the materials that are available. Uh, for the reconstruction of, of these extinct types of Uralic uh, that was spoken in this area. And at least you can see that the kind of Uralic uh, word stems that you can identify with some uh, certainty uh, seem to be quite different of the present-day Mali, for instance, or present-day Mali. So in present-day Mali you have um, a uh, late change uh, where all the civilians come together and, and here you have a clear system of three distinct civilians uh, in this area, things like that. So it's not clear if it's a separate branch or one of the part of one of the known branches. Well, obviously it's been intermediate between what we need yeah, and, yeah. and Finnic. Yeah. yeah, I would say. But but I think it's also the case that the Finnic and Morwinic became or dispersed from each other because these intermediate languages disappeared. So it's, <laughs> as long as these intermediate languages were there, those kind of dialects will continue. And it's also seen that we have a, a layer of Iranian borrowings in Finnic. It's quite clear that the Iranians never resided nowhere close to the Finnic areas, but we have this layer of Iranian loanwords coming through all these dialects or, or this, this linguistic continuum. And my other question was about your stambush. So it's not really a bush because there are kind of two trees there, right? Is, is it correct that all two bushes? So there was one clear split uh, between two. Uh, two parts of the family. Yeah, so, uh, well, this is very schematic, of course, but uh, it's just that uh, there are com com very much many competing views on this, uh, <laughs> on this uh, uh, family tree. For instance, Johan Jalhungen uh, is a supporter of binary branching family tree. Right here? Uh, no, uh, it's a completely different one. This is the kind of family tree that is supported by Tavari Salmin, and who always also is here. Uh, and, and, <laughs> he, he, and, and I'm the supporter of this bush like model that Tavari Salmin first introduced some 20 years ago. Uh, but of course, uh, even if we take this uh, bush like family tree, I think we still have to 
have to uh, admit that many branches have had mutual contacts that make them. Yeah, but my question was, do you understand this picture correctly that it's two bushes right? yeah. with a clear cut between them, eastern and western? Well, you can say it's eastern and western, yeah. yes, but uh, yeah, uh, but still, uh, I would say uh, it's one bush <laughs> with some eastern and, and western elements. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, it's clear well, that some of the yeah, some of the hunting monthly have uh, more to do with each other than they have to do with Sami and Finnick, for instance, and Sami and Finnick have more to do with each other than they have with uh, Hanti and Samoyedi. But I think this is mainly because of, of, of contacts that took place, not because of the inherited language material. So I think that it's very hard actually to reconstruct the kinds of innovations that would be characteristic for two branches only. So if there are some things that you find in Finnic and Sami, like the consonantal gradation, for instance. But it's quite clear that the consonantal gradation is not a proto finnic phenomenon, uh, or a proto sami phenomenon, for that matter. So it's a kind of phenomenon that only spreads at the dispersal of these things, and then it spreads to both of these branches uh, as an innovation, because people just somehow get this idea that we start to gradate our consonant clusters. Well, my question is that, uh, that uh, even sometimes if we know the uh, original language of all uh, there are some questions sometimes, because it's a particular fact that uh, we know that both uh, languages gave lots of uh, borrowings to Finnish and the branches, but some schools know that uh, both languages uh, spread, uh, were spread until the northern Tatarstan, till the northern city of Kazan. But uh, why, uh, for example, Maric languages have uh, too little number of uh, such uh, volumes in their vocabulary? So we must uh, maybe investigate more in that question. So well, I think uh, Mod Vinic clearly has uh, a layer of uh, Baltic borrowings, and I think this is relevant. Uh, and whereas Mari has not. But why? Uh, well, this is a good question, uh, and I think the answer must be that the Mari language has been somewhere else that is not the Baltic language. It is probably, probably. Baltic substrate is uh, quite, uh, we can find it in the areas uh, which, uh, which we have shown in your mark as the origin of the Mari and proto language. So it's quite. Uh, well, uh, I'm not exactly sure that you can find the Baltic substrate uh, in the Lower, like middle Volga, so you can find it somewhere in Smolensk and, and like the, uh, uh, of course, the Belarus and, 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 and east to Belarus, probably up to Moscow, but pro no, probably not the central Volga, where I think the, 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 the Mari language originates. Uh, but I also think that um, Mari has been certainly more uh, a forest zone language, so it's more tiger language than more Monwinik. Monwinik represents also a notable layer of Iranian borrowings, whereas Mari does not really have uh, a layer of Iranian borrowings. It has, it has very few stray borrowings, so it's very different. So uh, Monwinik has both Baltic and Iranian, uh, whereas uh, Mari has actually uh, none of them. So uh, it must have been somewhere, uh, probably, uh, probably uh, isolated from these Indo-European sources by some Uralic buffer that then disappeared. Because I think that there are been these Uralic buffer languages that disappeared when this Slavization took place. And, and it might not be the case that some of those languages have actually functioned as kind of so that, that, that made it impossible for 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 borrowings to spread to the mind. But of course, many details are fuzzy. And, and all these maps, the maps that I showed you, it is just the like, first, uh, first uh, try to uh, try for a kind of, uh, 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 how do you say, uh, uh, reconstruction back step by step. So most of the time when we have this discussion of where proto uralic was spoken, you only take the proto uralic vocabulary and then take the other linguistic evidence and look for the tree names and fish names and things like that. Whereas here I try to do it step by step by first reconstructing the places where the intermediate proto languages were spoken and then uh, go back to the proto uralic. Uh, and a slide with. Uh aerial uh, neighbors of Uralic and substrates. Uh, can you show it? Uh, you mean this one? This one. 
uh, here to Kalgiris shown as uh, having no aerial contacts with uh, Samoyed, but I think this is incorrect because uh, we know that there are uh, Samoyed borrowings in Yupagir. And yes, of course, this, this, is all, this is all very schematic. Uh, as you see, I'm not very good in using uh, the uh, internet and uh, this, uh, uh, whatever you say, these programs that make maps. Because I made this myself. Sometimes I have help with some people who know better. But uh, of course, we know that these therapeutic influences come all the way here, and then they replace, they replace these Iranian influences. And we, we know that there is this area of nuclear assembly edge uh, contact that's then, that is then washed away uh, with the spread of, of, of two rules to that area. So it, sh it uh, shows the present day uh, distribution of Yopagir languages, but from the contacts with uh, Samoyedic, we see that they uh, were uh, spoken much more to the south. Than yeah, yeah, it must have been completely different at some point. It, uh, I think, I think it, Yopagir must have been spoken much wider to the west, I guess. To the west and south. Yes, probably. <laughs> in order to have uh, contacts with somebody else. Yeah, I, I can agree with that. Can I ask a related question? When you speak about the substrates in different Uralic languages, do you see anything in common between the substrates? So could these substrate languages be related to each other? Or is it just we have too little evidence to ask this kind of question? Well, I think they are unrelated, really. I think that um, mm, in the uh, if we if we uh, think of the past of the Arctic, we know that the groups that have been the, have been uh, hunter gatherer groups, uh, and 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 the normal size of one Arctic hunter gatherer language is something between five hundred and two thousand speakers maximum. Uh, and, and, and the kinds of language families that we found are also quite small, like Yugavir that consists of four languages, or the Yenseyan that likewise consists of three or four languages, and, and, and these only occupy the fairly small regions. So uh, I think that um, each of these groups has different substrates and probably from different language families. But then uh, what I also think is important is that um, if we look at the neighboring languages, like uh, the, not here we speak about, about Arctic, but if we speak about the deep history of the Baltic Sea region, for instance, I think it's worth noting that uh, Germanic and Finnic have a lot of uh, shared vocabulary. And of course, usually, uh, traditionally, this vocabulary is considered as Germanic borrowings in Finnic. Uh, but we now know that this uh, Germanic vocabulary does not really have good Indo-European background and this Germanic substrate theory that points to uh, the idea that uh, Germanic borrowed uh, words from unidentified sources when it spread to Europe, uh, it's, it's gained more support. Uh, and I think that uh, we might believe that, for instance, in Baltic Sea Basin there's been some kind of like, language family or something like that, and then both the Uralic speakers and Germanic speakers uh, Borrowed words from that, uh, like words for like words for seal or words for whitefish or whatever, because they are very similar. It's actually quite hard to say if this is borrowed from Finnic to Germanic or vice versa, or if it's just a local word. It's a, 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 from in a semantic perspective, it's it's a perfect match for local words. It's, a, a, it's, it's a kind of local word that you have in these substrates over here. Just to comment on that, I think that uh, there must have been at least as many languages in the past as there are now. So, for instance, we have about 10 Sami languages. So I think each Sami language has a substrate of its own. There was some group speaking. Maybe some of them were related, maybe not related, but they, each of them must have had a separate population under them, which spoke some, some other language. Of course, if we look at the um, Ugrian and, and Sami groups, uh, they usually have some ecological basis. So if you look at the Ugrian uh, 
dialects as they are called, but they are actually more languages than dialects, then they are usually spread so that one language is spoken in one river basin, and then another river basin has a completely different language. So you have like Sojba, Lojba, and, 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 and etc. Kazim, and, and this is totally different from, from the next river. And, and I think it's, and the, the Sami languages are just a similar case. So you have like Pite, Sami, Uma, Sami, so one river basin for one language. And, and these can be uh, widely, widely different, so it would be no, no uh, wonder if they also represented different substances. May I have to comment? So we saw that map of Amazonian region, so we saw this diversity in the Amazonian region. Yeah. 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 Y
after I think Brother King Alfred King. Uh, yeah. made a, has a paper on the language family density in Eurasia and America. Mm -hmm. And he noticed that the language family density in Eurasia is much lower than in the Americas because uh, there have been so many big expansions in Eurasia, like the Iraq expansion and the European and South So they have replaced and covered so many language families uh, and also languages. And I also think that this expansion history is related to the ecolo to ecological factors. Uh, the uh, Eurasian uh, taiga and steppe zone is free of any uh, eco ecological boundaries or, or geographical boundaries that would prevent people from moving. So even in historical times we have at least four or five language shifts in, in this area. <laughs> well, 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 not in this area, but in the southern parts of what is now Russia, where the Slavic population really originates. We know that the Slavic population replaced uh, Kipchak Turkey population that replaced Bulgar Turkey population that replaced Iranian population that replaced some other type of, 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 of Indo European population, etc. Et so there are so many language shifts uh, in the history that we can reconstruct. Uh, and and, and all, of take, uh, all of them take this huge area very quickly, very quickly, because this area is just, in an ecological perspective, it's a kind of area that, you, that can be uh, occupied very, very easily. Yeah, and, 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 and for that matter, it's pretty similar to the Austronesian expansion, I would say. Austronesian also expanded uh, without, uh, without uh, great uh, geographical uh, hindrances. They, they were taking new territory. Yeah, yeah but, but this was uh, due to new technologies that they invented and then they, they could just take new territories. I think for, for the Russians for, or for any people, it was no big deal to take Siberia, for instance, because <coughs> it, it has so, had so few people. Uh, by the time the Russians entered Siberia 16th century, it's estimated that there was less than one million people between Urals and, and the, the uh, uh, Pacific Sea. And by that time, the European Russia already had something like 10 million or 15 million or whatever. So the Russians were <laughs> hugely over overwhelming any <laughs> any other people in that area. So but they still had, they still had to conquer Siberia. Still. Yeah they still had to conquer conquer but it, it was no big deal actually. Mm -hmm. So I think it was probably it was much easier to conquer Siberia Siberia than it was to conquer Americas. And the United States had something like twelve million people when the white people arrived. So and they conquered only the Tatar army. And after that, they just yeah, of course, the Tatar army was the hard, hard place. But after the Tatar army was was conquered, uh, it was no problem to to occupy the whole of Siberia. But we must mention that to conquer the Chichi people is uh, were very hard for the Russian yeah. or even in the Kerala side. Because Chichi had a really highly uh, developed uh, war culture that uh, practically none of people so far east or northern Siberia had. So it was uh, a really hard task to conquer the extreme uh, northern parts of the Siberia, even in the 19th century or 18th century, where there are some just uh, old traditions of, uh, of war culture. Yeah, sure. Of course, there were all kinds of local, local problems. Not depending local. on the figures of the people, uh, the numbers. <laughs> I think I think also like in a similar manner to Amazonia, I think the the, the, the ecology, ecology ecology has also preserved some of this linguistic multitude in Russia because uh, the nature in Siberia is so hostile uh, in, in many ways that not many people want to go there and, and, and it's not possible to live there if you don't have very uh, specific uh, uh, technologies for that uh, and I think it's preserved this linguistic uh, multitude up to our days actually because still if, if we think of the Russian territory I think like three quarters or, or, or 20 percent uh, three quarters or even more of the Russian territory still is a, a land where the local language is not Russian it's something else and it's also because the, 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 the uh, uh, local circumstances are very severe in many cases. And in the Amazon, uh, uh, 
Indians have lived there for 15,000 years, say, and Europeans can only live there by destroying the place. 500 years almost. Wow. The rainforest is gone. So, uh, the ecology has to, has to step aside. Uh, I just say that there are some areas in Siberia, like the Putorana Plain. It's my dream to visit the place, but it, it's totally empty and it's about uh, the, at least twice the size of dinner. And it, it's between, it's to the east of the NSA. Putin, Putin used to travel there for fishing. But uh, it's totally empty, so there is no historically documented people living there. And it's a very large area, uh, mainly forest uh, and small rivers, but not occupied by the enemy. We have to stop here.